So, gentlemen, could I just say to you, welcome our new club manager, Graham Sunnis. With the arrival of Graham Sunnis at Ibrox Park, Glasgow, the home of Rangers Football Club, a century of sectarianism could be at an end in Scotland. Welcome to the club again. Rangers, an establishment institution founded on the commerce of Victorian Glasgow. Discipline, tradition and Protestantism have been the watchwords. Now they're looking to Graham Sunnis for the success that will fill the stadium. On the other side of the city, Celtic Football Club, Irish in background and happy to declare it, the most successful club of recent decades. But the gulf between Rangers and Celtic is a scar as well as a division. So could Graham Sunnis be stepping out of the Italian frying pan into the Glasgow fire? In 1888, Celtic Football Club emerged from the grinding poverty of Glasgow's East End with a specific mission to raise money for the Catholic poor. Rangers had been in successful business for 15 years, soon setting a precedent since maintained for fine stadiums. Celtic quickly became a major power from the East End, drawing on a huge support. And with a foundation inspired by Brother Walford, a Marist from County Sligo, they identified fully with their background. The great Irish land leaguer, Michael Davitt, was the first patron and laid a centre turf of shamrocks at Celtic Park. The Irish in Glasgow identified keenly with events across the water. A rapidly developing Glasgow rivalry soon proved to be good box office and stayed that way. And Celtic's early success was spectacular. They won six league titles in a row up to 1910. The upstarts from the East End had Rangers struggling to keep pace. The arrival of Belfast shipyard workers in 1912 has been credited with giving Rangers their Protestant edge. But Calvin of Scotland was capable of producing its own reaction to an organisation that was Irish, mainly Catholic and successful. Under Bill Struth, the hard No Catholics line became enshrined. He had his autocratic counterpart at Celtic Park, Willie Maley, a man shrewd enough not to minimise the differences. Football was the mass male entertainment of the interwar years. It was an age of spindly-legged giants, Celtic's cup-winning forward line of 1928, Rangers' well-attired victors of the early 30s. By the 1930s, the green and the blue dyes were cast. By cruel mischance, a martyr was now to enter the mythology. John Thompson, the prince of goalkeepers, young, graceful and infinitely courageous. A dive at the feet of Sam English ended his life and launched the legend. Like many of Celtic's greatest players, John Thompson was not a Catholic, just an exceptionally good goalkeeper from the Fife Pits. However irrationally though, his death deepened the wedge that divided the terracings and the city. He became a lasting symbol of the old rivalry. Forty thousand paid homage at his funeral in Carden Den, many of those who couldn't afford the fare walking from Glasgow and camping out. Jim Thompson, still in Carden Den, recalls his brother's passing. Uh, I, I called him a foolish goal. I remember just not long before he was fatally injured. And his jaw was broken and shoulder blade. I said, John, this will have to stop. But he says, the only thing I see there is a ball, and it must be mine. Oh, I say, I quite understand, but it, you'll have to top hatter, he won't be there long. In the first game he played after it, he did the very same thing, right at her feet. And Mother, for all that Sam English did it, she didn't blame him for his death. He was just playing the game, too. 
He was a very, very popular boy. I mean, religion didn't I mean so very much to John. He, he would have played for Rangers, he would have played for Celtic, he would have played for anybody that got there first. He was quite popular with the Rangers boys too. And mind at that time, it, it was pretty deadly in Glasgow. Celtic and Rangers. Farewell, my darling Johnny. Prince of clay, as we must part. No more we'll stand and cheer you on the slopes of Saudi Park. Sam English headed south and never fully recovered from the trauma, particularly from Maley's reluctance to acknowledge that it had been an accident. Rangers taking the 1934 Scottish Cup 5-0 against St Mern. It was the age of huge crowds, and that meant big business. In the late 30s, the Ibrooks ground record was set at 118,000, Celtic Parks at 92,000. When Celtic ran out to meet Aberdeen in the 1937 Scottish Cup final, there were over 146,000 in Hampden. This really was football in its heyday. Celtic lifted the cup for the 15th time, and Willie Maley reflected on the club's humble origins 50 years earlier. I recall, he wrote, the struggles of our early days, but nothing but dogged determination kept our flag flying. Jimmy McGrory became Celtic's post-war manager, but by that time, the flying of the flag was causing problems. In 1952, Celtic survived an effort to ban them for flying the Irish flag in commemoration of their roots. Rangers supported them, while Hibs, of all people, by that time far removed from their own origins, led the attack. Now, having triumphed in this bitter dispute off the park, Celtic could take special satisfaction from beating Hibs in the UK-wide Coronation Cup final, in these pre-European days the greatest available achievement. Jock Steen shepherded the Celtic defence. It was also the era of John McPhail, Bobby Evans, Willie Fernie and the great Charlie Tully. Ibrooks, in all its glittering austerity, was seeing the end of Bill Struth's reign, but his spirit and preoccupations were to live on. He was a, such a powerful man that we all, more or less, uh, behaved ourselves, you know, as much as we could. Uh, you know, late nights and things like that, and boozing and all that. That was all in. I've seen many players shaking in their shoes whenever the intercom went and there was something to go upstairs. You didn't know what you were going to get when you are upstairs. It may have been good, it may have been bad news. <laughs> but uh, with old Bill, there was not really a lot of bad news. It was all for your own good, your own benefit. And it made you a man in life. And uh, I would say here and now that that was one of the main things in these days of Rangers Football Club, that you had, first of all, had to be a man. I was saying not by Scott Simon in these days. I was signed as a schoolboy prodigy by the late uh, Bill Struth, which goes quite, quite a bit, but I was just a young lad. And we were always brought up in a sense of discipline, you know, such, just like your public schools are told, you know, they're well-dressed, well-mannered, watch where you are, because everywhere you go, you represent the club, you've got to project the image as such. So there was a strictness and there was a discipline that uh, I think then uh, stays with you throughout your whole life then, you know. Scott Simon, an old Ibrox favourite, had replaced Struth and he suffered an early 7-1 indignity at Celtic's hands in the 1957 League Cup final. But by the turn of the decade, built around the outstanding talents of Jim Baxter, their best side of the modern era was in place. There were no tactics in that, and he just he bought players as you're playing 4 2 4. That was the thing. Ian McMillan out in the middle of the park. Now you've got the big Harry and then Greg and that coming out, McKinnon and all that. 
but I can't set up. But there were no tactics getting in and we've got to do this. You just done your training. So you went out and played your game and that was it. But you went to Glasgow and the rest of it all. It was, you know, the best seats and I don't bother about the bill. I wish they would do that now. <laughs> no, it was great to be a Rangers player at that time. I don't know now how the, the, the thing means, but there's definitely the same adulation as there was in my day. And it's the 65, uh, 60 to 65, the first five years I was at Ibrox, as I said, we're a great team, we're winning everything. I mean, the crowds were 60,000 and that easily. It was, it was fantastic. And the football was great to Ian McMillan. I wonder if the likes of Ian McMillan and myself would get a kick at the ball now. That's all. Everybody's running about like mad. But I think the 60s teams, you know, uh, what was it again? Nevin Shearer or Richie Shearer, Carlo, Greg McKinnon, Baxter, Henderson, McMillan, Miller, Brandon, Wilson. I mean, it's a fabulous team. They're not trying to tell me that team playing the day when they won that Premier League. They were scooshing. The first piece of cup luck to Celtic who won the toss, so it's Rangers to kick off in this cup final replay at Hamden. Straight away, a foul given against Chalmers of Celtic. Baxter going to take the kick. Crowd of approaching 130,000 here at Hamden. The atmosphere just ripe for an exciting, tense cup final match. Celtic have put out a short forward line with Bobby Craig, the outside right, Murdo, Hughes, Divers and Chalmers, the rest of the forwards. There's Brand, Ian McMillan, of course, back at inside right for Rangers. Murdo. Touch on to Miller. McMillan, a pass to Henderson. Friend, after eight minutes, play has shot Rangers into a one-goal lead and see the tremendous excitement on the terracing. Place to Divers. Robin Wilson. Brand. And flicks it on the inside of Mackay, who topples down, but... Judging that Mackay fouled Wilson. Baxter would take this free kick. Back to me, heads it away. Here's Miller. Left foot drive, and it comes cannons off the post. Well, certainly so far, Shiller and Problem managed to snap out the challenge. Here's Hughes. Well, that's been Celtic's best try of the match so far. I've just been saying there, but Hughes must have heard me. Just been saying how effectively the challenge of the Celtic wingers have been cut out by Shearer and Proven. You'd notice that Hughes had, had his success coming through the middle. Maybe significant. Divers. Rolling it towards Craig. Baxter. such tremendous applause from these packed Hamden terraces because that really was a magnificent shot by Brand. So it now looks certain that Rangers will equal the Scottish Cup record of Celtic by bringing the tally up to 17 here at Hamden Park in this Cup final replay. Oh, I didn't want to leave Rangers. I mean, they were a great club, but they didn't pay the money. And Rain just paid everybody the same. Well, I didn't agree with that. I mean, you have, it's like putting Frank Sinatra on by the Alexander brothers and getting the same money. So Sunderland came up with you, could I went there. Well, in my opinion, Jim Baxter was um, one of the greatest players uh, I've ever seen in my lifetime. And uh, I honestly think it was a, a mistake on the part of the Rangers board to let him uh, 
let him go. And I think if you check back, you will find that uh, the decline of Rangers in the 60s coincided with um, the selling of Jim Baxter, and it also uh, coincided with the ascent of Celtic. There had been lean Celtic years, but when Chairman Bob Kelly brought Jockstein back as manager, the Kelly kids soon matured. In the years that Jockstein was at Celtic Park, I mean, he brought Celtic uh, from being a top club in Scotland, basically, to being a top club in Europe. And um, he put in an awful lot of work uh, to that end, albeit he had, uh, he had a lot of good players as well, but um, it's basically a team effort from top to bottom. And he, as I say, gelled us all together and got us working as a team. Everything had to be done right. I mean, if we're doing shooting at Barrafield, and if the goalkeeper blocked it, he kicked goalkeeper Bonham in the back of the net. Every exercise was finished. He didn't. If you're running 50 yards, you couldn't run 47 or 48 yards. If you did that, you're back to start again. Everything was done. Had to be done right. Jock tried to treat you as adults, and he hoped you you responded as adults. And if you responded as adults, then you didn't have a particular problem. Um, he, he had this he had this image of being a big hard man. I always thought he was a big softy, to be quite frank with you. If you're ever late, you're just left out of the team and didn't believe in waiting. You know, if you, you did everything right, if he told you that was right, I mean, the pack he was just God, you know, he was, just, he was a man. In 1967, Celtic reached the pinnacle of their history. The club, founded to help the poor and who had retained the loyalties of a ghetto minority, were elevated to the heights of European football. The folk who bore the green and white headed for Lisbon. The incredible had happened. Celtic were in the final of the world's greatest club competition, the European Cup. The whole stage was set for us. We came there and everybody was there, the Celtic sport had already been there and they'd influenced the, the Portuguese to such an extent that they started to look for us to win rather than anything else. Into Milan looked really dangerous here. Capellini was brought down by Craig, a penalty. With the spot kick, Mazzola made no mistake. And one of the best things that ever happened was the fact that they scored first. Because from then on in, it was just a fierce determination. We, we thought the penalty was very harsh at the time, but, you know, having seen it a hundred times since then on, on tape and, and whatnot, I, I'm inclined to agree the referee was right. But, but at that time, we felt a grievance about it. So from then on in, there was only that absolute determination to see a, a wrong as we felt it put right and I don't think there was ever any other result than the one that was achieved. In fact I think to be honest with the interim line got off very lightly that day. Then fullback Tommy Gemmell shot from 25 yards out. Gemmell's brilliant goal didn't put new heart into Celtic. The old one was good enough to beat anybody. And how their supporters thank their stars they'd come to Lisbon. Barely seven minutes from time came the winning goal. Chalmers deflected Murdoch's shot past Sati. That was how Celtic became the first ever British team to win the European Cup. McNeil and his magnificent men earned the thanks and admiration of their native Glasgow, Scotland, and the whole United Kingdom. While Celtic flourished, the rivals had sunk into a rut. In 1967, they suffered a devastating defeat at Berwick in the Scottish Cup, a trauma that had far-reaching consequences. Not least the town of Berwick was subjected to post-match mayhem, one in a sequence of such episodes that drew increasing and unwelcome attention to the Ibrox ethos. The man who defied Rangers was a goalkeeper called Jock Wallace. Coupled with Celtic's European success, Berwick serve noticed that time and football progress were passing Ibrox by. Scott Simon was soon unceremoniously removed. Well, obviously it was a, it was a hard time then. I mean, it was a big shock. It was, in fact, it was a disaster, really. The only thing, it wasn't a disaster for me because I got my chance to play in the first team. And as I say, it was a time in the club when, they, after the Berwick game, there was a few players that never played for the club again. There were opportunities for Rangers to change their ways. The 1971 disaster, when 66 people died in Stairway 13 at Ibrooks, should have put football in perspective. Glasgow was united in grief. 
but this moment of ecumenical conciliation proved all too temporary. The European Cup winners' cup final, Barcelona, 1972. It's a dangerous team. Magnificent goal. Magnificent goal. Comes to Smith. Smith almost overrunning it, but keeping possession nicely. Smith now chopping it across with his left foot. Chance for the Johnston. And it's there. Prodigious kick from McCly. Huge ball. Straight through to Johnston. Johnston in front of goal, and it's a goal! A sensational goal by Johnston! Derek Johnston to Matheson. Matheson in trouble there. And this could be dangerous. Good chance for Dynamo. And it must be a goal. It is. The substitute scores. Three minutes to play. Rangers still lead 3-1. Makovikov still going. The Russians are not finished yet. They're still trying. Makovikov coming through. And it's a goal! But even Rangers' finest hour was to turn so. The fans came up the park as you well know. It was all the problems and uh, I always visualised winning a European trophy, picking up the cup and being able to go around the park and show all the supporters we had travelled halfway over Europe to see it. But I, I walked into a room similar, not, not any bigger than this, and there was a big desk, a big table like this, and the UEFA committee sent at the back of it and the cup in the middle, and I had my strip and everything on, and he just says, right, Rangers Football Club, winners, hand me the cup, and I walked along another corridor and all the boys were sitting in the bath by the time I got back. They came home to the welcome that the performance in Barcelona merited. It had been a tremendous display from Rangers under Willie Waddle and coach Jock Wallace. But the violent aftermath ensured that the club once again faced searching questions about the dogma that set them apart. Willie Waddle eventually yielded to mounting public pressure. He went to the centre circle at Ibrox to tell the faithful that a new era was on hand. Nothing duly happened. Except that David Hope was ditched as club chairman amidst questions about his long dead wife's religion. But there are other special ingredients which keep the old firm turnstiles clicking. The atmosphere. A lot of them used to get sick. I loved it. The bigger the crowd, the better I loved it. The atmosphere itself was superb, absolutely superb. Uh, even, I think it even surpassed uh, the atmosphere in the Scotland-England game. The noise was the overwhelming feature. This noise which was there when you went onto the field and was invariably there all the way through until you came off. And you were aware as a referee that you could blow for an infringement and the players wouldn't hear you. You may have to blow twice or three times or you may have to blow very loudly. Uh, this um, was always a consideration. But then there was moments when uh, I remember coming off one day at Celtic Park and uh, um, the spectator leaned over the old tunnel and Rangers had won this match and he addressed me in the affectionate manner that spectators always reserve for referees and then told me that it wasn't a whistle I should have, it was a flute. I went to play with Sheffield Wednesday for a period of time after uh, Rangers and we had a derby match there between Sheffield Wednesday and Sheffield United and you know the fans were getting excited, the press were doing interviews and that and uh, I was asked how did it compare with the Rangers and Celtic Old Firm match? I said it's like a Sunday school picnic. They've got atmosphere certainly the Manchester derby but nothing nothing that would even compare with the, the atmosphere um, that, that, that an old firm game generates. I think that, uh, I don't think there's any, I doubt very much that there's any game in the world would really compare with the atmosphere that generated between Celtic and Rangers. By the mid-70s, Rangers were successfully challenging Celtic's dominance with two trebles under Jock Wallace. The emergence of a serious challenge from the northeast was still a mere dot on a horizon which the Glasgow clubs dominated. Clean unmarked at the far side, Edmondson. 
And then across by Young. Here's McDonald. Great ball. 21 minutes in the second half. Ali McDonald breaks the deadlock. Rangers lead by one goal to nil. You know, it's one of the few places where you can change your religion every time you go from one end of the football ground to the other. And I've been insulted by experts at both ends of the ground. And uh, um, you are always aware that this is a keenly fought match. But the uh, religious aspect, or say the religious aspects, don't come onto the field of play at all. But at the end of the 1980 Scottish Cup final, they did come onto the field of play with a degree of nastiness that prompted wider Scottish society to call ever more insistently for change. Change in the drink laws which followed, and change also in Rangers' defiantly sectarian policy. I think the biggest problem of that uh, religious situation is going to be how you break it, how you eventually break the walls. I mean, the, the press and the media bring it up all the time. Uh, and I, I feel that it may be better if uh, there were six or seven youngsters, 13, 14 year old, signed and allowed to grow into the club uh, and get to know that the, there is a football player. Uh, let's just go to the top of the tree. You see players like Pelly and Michelle Platini. You know, if they can't get a game for, and Alfredo De Stefano, one of these guys, if they couldn't pull a Rangers jersey over their shoulder, well, I'll eat my bonnet. You know? Probably a thing about Hamden, I think it would make Rangers a better team. Although possibly a lot of Rangers fans will disagree with me on that, but I'm just speaking the truth, I feel. Genoa had been home for Graham Souness for two seasons since he parted company with Liverpool at the end of a fabulously fruitful relationship. At Sampdoria, he revelled in the atmosphere of Italian league football, custom built for his temperament and style. But by last November, the thought had already occurred to Rangers chief executive David Holmes that this just might be the man to transform Ibrook's fortunes. Graham Souness's own thoughts were couched in much more general terms. I'd like to go back and, and have a go at management. I don't know about player management because I, you know, I'd, I can't rule anything out, but I'd, I think ideally I'd like to leave any memories I had or any memories people have of me of being a, a reasonable player back home is leave it, leave it that way. When I was younger, I didn't fancy it at all, the coaching and the management side. I think as you get older, maybe you, you kid yourself on it, you know a bit more than you actually do and, and would like to try your own ideas out. I'd like to give it a go. Even while the first tentative contacts are being established between Rangers and Sooners, the build-up is underway for the latest encounter in Glasgow's own gladiatorial tradition. At Celtic Park, David Hay has lived through a couple of rocky seasons, but the board has just confirmed the security of his position. In this game, above all others, he knows that he will also have the terracings to answer to.
to the players without you actually saying too much. Uh, we've both had an indifferent season so far, uh, but that didn't take away from the fact that it's going to be a sellout, and that more or less sums up the importance of a Celtic and Rangers game to both sets of fans. To me, beyond any shadow of a doubt, it's the best club game in the world. For the, you don't, it's not, it's not towns divided; it's a country's divided. It's an important game for both clubs. Celtic are still chasing the Premier League title, though more in hope than optimism. For Rangers, the immediate priority is to salvage the last lucrative Scottish place in Europe. Every seat in Ibrook Stadium is filled. Whatever their form, Celtic and Rangers are still number one at the box office, and they still provide that magic ingredient. What's special about a Celtic Rangers game? The atmosphere. atmosphere. It's a game, but to other folk, it's 90 minutes of pure bigotry. It comes to no, it's been religion right through. It seems to be a way back in history. I know a different supporters. It just seem to have a special thing for the game. Celtic and Rangers supporters together. And once they're outside the park, there's a lot of friendship there. Great being Celtic. Great being. Why you protect all your Celtic? It's just a tradition. As far as I'm concerned, the Celtic Rangers game is it's sat in bread and have you a glass pigeon. But you're either one or the other. Well, it's no use listening to the radio. Or anything like that. You have to come to a game like this to enjoy it. There's always been a great respect between the, 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 the people at Rangers and Celtic. You know, first team level, reserve team level, U team level. We all want to be each other, but in the aftermath of it all, I wonder how you feel. Yeah, I suppose at the end of the day, since you become a manager, you actually feel a bit of sympathy towards your opposite number, Jock Wallace. Whereas they're a player. I don't suppose you shook hands with your opponents and you were delighted you win, but I think after that bit of elation, there is a bit of sympathy that goes towards the, your opposite number, because you know the feeling yourself. notice the rain if you're locked outside. The choirs are in full cry. The polarisation is complete.
After the agony and the ecstasy, the important game was now the next one. But Jock Wallace's respite was to be strictly temporary, for other wheels were well in motion. The ultimate Ibrox man was about to undergo a cruel test of character. There had been changes in the Ibrox boardroom. The men now in charge wanted success, yes, but they also wanted to dress it up in a change of image. Tradition was no longer an adequate defence for failure, and Jock Wallace didn't fit the plans. Media men had learned the real reason for soon as his visit to Glasgow. Jock Wallace's hours were numbered, and the cat was out of the bag. Rangers had to act quickly. For Wallace, the end came quickly. It was the Scottish football story of the decade, and as a story, it had the great merit of surprise. But the ink on Graham Souness's contract was hardly dry before the bigger question was being asked around the land, the question which decades of Ibrooks and transigens had made legitimate and inevitable. Seventy-two hours after the Sooners appointment and the Ranger support turn out in force at Clyde Bank for the first opportunity to engage in the debate. Does their satisfaction with the impending arrival of Sooners the player and manager outweigh the tribal suspicions about the prospect of Sooners the reformer? I think it's the best move Rangers have made in years. I just hope he does the best because you know Graham Sooners, he's everywhere he's went, he's had made improvements and he's just been brilliant so I just hope he makes changes with Rangers. I think Graham Souness will be a good, a good signing for Rangers. And um, it's taking the papers. Rangers are expecting success yesterday. I don't believe in that. I think Rangers will get success. Two or three years for Graham to settle in. He's going to take two years to settle in at least. He's an unknown quantity as a manager. He's a rare player. No surrender! We're not caring about that as long as he doesn't sign Catholic. Why do you say that? We've went 113 years with Thurlow. Why start now? If he signs that, and I'll see, right? But lose it, Rangers will lose a lot of support, it's as easy as that. Well, I'll not change anything on the terraces. No, we'll still have uh, sectarian songs, we'll still be Protestants. And if these players are uh, willing to accept it, by all means, they want to play for the club, let them play for the club. If they score three against Celtic, I'll be happy. Well, as long as a, a Rangers player goes on to park and plays a blue shirt and plays for a Rangers team, I don't care who he signs. Well, I'm more excited about Graham soon as possibly the player, what I'm a yeah. manager, but yeah. in the long run, yeah. I believe it'll be a good move for the Glasgow Rangers. Now we'll be a more European orientated club, can only do well. We've got a lot of traditions at Ibrox, and we don't want to see them broke for the sake of one man. Soon as I know, we like our own traditions. I think the fans are desperate now for a winning side, and if it's just to come down to that, they're not going to come down. He said that he would sign Catholics, but if you look at big Jock Wallace, he said he would sign Catholics when he first came on, and he never ever do that. I think it's all talk. That's all of them if it does. If we get a European Cup, if we win a European Cup, and I'll be the first one to go and support him, right? But I want to know why all these man. press men don't get at Celtic for not getting a process director in their box. They don't yeah. get a yeah. It's all the judges got. Yeah. The we've got a world class player and keep bringing it in. You don't, don't got anybody else except us. Only time can tell, I think. You know, you're bringing in another sort of inexperienced manager. It could be a success or it could be a flop. It's just a, it's a gamble I think Rangers are taking. But to me, it's a good gamble, you know. And there's another gamble. That there are more folk interested in supporting a winning Rangers team than in its religious makeup. Time alone will tell. Rangers lost this one 2 1. Tradition seems rather a grand word with which to dignify the 75 year old practice of not allowing people of a particular religion to play football for you. Is Graham Souness the man to finally lay the religious ghost while rediscovering the other Ibrook tradition of winning more than the occasional trophy?
It's um, very impressive. I think this is as impressive as, as any have been, and certainly as impressive as Liverpool's. OK, the, the trophies are different to the ones they've got there, but there's certainly more here than there are in Liverpool. It's, it's a very impressive sight. A lot of history here. More history here than, than I think I've seen anywhere else. Really, I don't know the, that much about the, the traditions of the club, apart from the obvious things. Um, this is something I'm, I'm going to learn and have to learn quickly. Um, what about the football passion in the city of Glasgow, well, Graham? Yeah, that's another thing which I'm going to have to adjust to. Although I played football in, in Liverpool for seven years and it's the same, a big city, a big port city divided by, with two great teams. And uh, there was a lot of passion there, but maybe feelings already out, there's more here. Um, to begin with, I'm hoping I can give them results and at the end of the day, maybe two or three years results with, with style and the sort of football I want to, to be part of, both playing and, and watching as a manager. I want to continue playing in midfield for as long as I feel I'm doing the job there because I feel that is my best position. But at the end of the day, if um, I feel I can no longer do the job as I want to do it, then I'd be looking to, to maybe drop back and play in the defence. I, um, I would love to, after six months of next season, they will not to include myself because with that many good players here playing well, that would be a great situation. Are you prepared to play anyone of any religion? I think I've said it all before. I'd just like to, to go over it again. The job was offered to me, an understanding that the situation would be um, that Catholics were going to be signed if they were good enough to play for Rangers FC. I certainly wouldn't have taken the job under any other circumstances. If they're good enough. I think at the end of the day, Jim, if people, if they're Rangers supporters, and I mean Rangers supporters, not people who've got, um, are using the club as some sort of vehicle for, for anything else, um, if they want, if they're a Rangers supporter, they want to see the team winning. That's all that matters. That's all that should matter. And uh, I shall give them. I shall try and give them that. And if that means signing Catholics and upsetting people, I shall do that. If it means getting a winning team, because at the end of the day, that's what I've been brought here for. That's all I'm interested in is winning. Some Rangers supporters say they won't come and watch Rangers if Graham Souness signs a Catholic. Um, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but at the end of the day, I think it's the only way forward. Look at the way the club's gone over the last, in recent years anyway, let's not put a, a figure on it, but in recent years. And I don't think this issue has helped the club in any way. And I think um, the quicker we get rid of that, then we can make this big step forward and hopefully put Rangers where they should be, as the premier club in, in Scotland, and maybe one day the premier club in Great Britain. If Glasgow's going to project itself in, as to be an international city of the future, we really have to try and look at the sectarianism um, in a broader field. Now, Graham Souness has already said, and I understand that the Rangers chief executive and people have said that Graham Souness will be able to sign whoever he wants, and it will be his football ability that will determine it. Now, at the time when I nominated and moved Kenny Dalglish as a freeman of the city of Glasgow, one of the things that I said was that Kenny Dalglish was able to cross the bridge that was supposed to exist in Glasgow. You know, Kenny Dalglish was a, a well-known Rangers supporter as a youth and became a very successful professional footballer for Celtic. So, I mean, if, if Graham Souness, and I have no reason to doubt his sincerity when he said that he will sign whoever it is, it's their football ability, if Graham Souness is able to sign and get rid of this apparent tradition that exists at Ibrox, of not having any Catholic working for them or playing for them, if Graham Souness can overcome that, then he will help the Glasgow of the future. We'll be able then to project to the world that different barriers we have, different religions we have, different communities we have in Glasgow, but we can still all work with each other for the common good. You've never seen an old firm game then. What have you been told about those games? Well, I, obviously Kenny Dalglish has told me a great deal about them. I think he he would say they're even bigger than the Everton-Liverpool one. There's more passion involved. I, um, I'm looking forward to it, Jim. I'm looking forward to watching them. But first, I'm looking forward to playing them. Long ball through to Paul Lane. McDonald stepping in. Paul Lane there with Connolly. What a smash. Back out to Young finally. Con shouting for it. Over it comes. Headed in by Con. That's the goal.
Mr. Wilson. What a ball, what a pass, what a chance. What a goal. Playing the ball, bending out the way Colin Jackson under it. Steen going up to Johnston. Steen again, what a chance. Thank you. 